In the previous lecture, at the end, I began talking a little bit about the link uh, with the man who was Thursday to the book of Job, and I want to pick that up here in this lecture and expand that a little bit. So at the end of that last lecture, in talking about the creation days and the way that each of the characters in the Anarchist Council reflect and embody uh, and even manifest some of the characteristics of that creation day, I mentioned that there was a link there with the book of Job with the seven sons who each held a feast on his own day. And I think that there's definitely some parallels there. Um, but I think that connection is strengthened significantly when we can make the case that there are a lot of other factors in this book that make that parallel with the book of Job. And so uh, one of the things I think to begin with uh, is something that Martin Gardner uh, in his analysis of this book says, he says, uh, the book, quote, revolves around two of the deepest of all theological mysteries, the freedom of the will and the existence of massive, irrational evil. The two mysteries are closely related, end quote. So both of these, evil as a result of human freedom and evil as a result of nature, are both a problem for the theist. Uh, but Martin Gardner, I think, answers this problem well. He writes, quote, the only possible way a theist can escape from the atheist charge, either God is malevolent or there is no God, is to view nature as the back of reality. Beyond what Lord Dunsany liked to call the fields we know, there is a larger, wholly other, unseen realm. Logic cannot prove its existence, and science is helpless in efforts to penetrate it. But by a leap of faith, we can escape despair by looking forward to a life beyond the grave, where God will in some manner, utterly beyond our understanding, rectify the mad injustices of the fields we know. This is the great hope that glows at the heart of theism and at the core of Chesterton's melodrama, end quote. And here's where I think we get into the book of Job, because there's one book of scripture that deals with the problem of evil more than any other. That's the book of Job. And there are numerous parallels then between the man who was Thursday and the book of Job, they're going to help us see that both of them are wrestling deeply with the question of the injustices of this world and why we endure suffering. So I mentioned the creation illusions, especially each man to his own day. We also have some references to the vastness and the incomprehensibility of nature. And if you think about Sunday's speech on page 130, it has a lot of parallels with God's response to Job from the whirlwind. Listen to what uh, Sunday says on page 130. I, what am I, roared the president as he rose slowly to an incredible height like some enormous wave about to arch above them and break. You want to know what I am, do you? Bull, you are a man of science. Grub in the roots of those trees and find out the truth about them. Syme, you are a poet. Stare at those morning clouds and tell me or anyone the truth about morning clouds. But I tell you this, that you will, found truth, you will found out the truth of the last tree in the topmost cloud before the truth about me. You will understand the sea, and I shall be a riddle. You shall know what the stars are, and not know what I am. Since the beginning of the world, all men have hunted me like a wolf. Kings and sages and poets and lawgivers, all the churches and all the philosophies. But I have never been caught yet, and the skies will fall in the time I turn to bay. I have given them a good run for their money, and I will now. Now, of course, there's a little bit more uh, kind of jest here, humor, than we get in the Lord's response to Job. But nevertheless, the Lord's response to Job is very clearly things like, Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I put the snow in their storehouses? When I set the boundaries of the waters? And of course, there's, there's this picture of this cosmic action of God from all eternity um, that Job can't possibly comprehend. And he says, uh, Sunday that is, says that no matter how deep Dr. Bull understands science or how well Syme understands poetry, they can find out the last bit of poetry, the last bit of understanding of science, and they'd still not be able to explain him. There's something about the vastness and the incomprehensibility of nature that compares uh, Sunday with God's response from the whirlwind. Uh, we have references in both Job and the man who is Thursday to animals that are portrayed as monsters. In fact, Chesterton writes in his introduction to the book of Job that I mentioned in the last lecture, 
Quote, he unrolls before Job a long panorama of created things. The horse, the eagle, the raven, the wild ass, the peacock, the ostrich, the crocodile. He so describes each of them that it sounds like a monster walking in the sun. End quote. Well, in The Man Who Was Thursday, we've got things like the elephant that Sunday rides as a possible allusion to behemoth. And he describes the hornbill as a monstrous joke of nature. And so some of these uh, ex explanations, uh, uh, illustrations of these uh, animal characters uh, have some parallels with the book of Job. Now those are a little bit um, more general. Perhaps you could make those parallels to a lot of different things. But it becomes more and more explicit as you get to chapter 15, which is actually called The Accuser. Um, in fact, the, the name Satan or you know, ha -satan, ha Satan in Hebrew is the adversary or the accuser. And so we have, in this sense, the title of the chapter reflecting the very name or uh, personality then of Satan. Uh, we have this anarchist council that's now gathered together for a meal, uh, which is similar to what we see of the council of angels in the book of Job. And so in uh, Job 1.8, we have this passage in which it says, um, And one day the sons of God uh, came uh, before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Well, we actually have this quoted um, on page 154, where it says, And there came a day, murmured Bull, who seemed really to have fallen asleep, when the sons of God came before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And so this is actually a direct quote from the book of Job that helps us make that connection, but also the fact um, that he's casting Gregory in the light of Satan, in the light of the accuser, with the, of course, um, title of the chapter called The Accuser, that again draws a parallel to the book of Job that I think is hard to ignore. And then finally, again, a little bit more general one, but I think in light of the other evidence uh, is helpful for us, is that Sunday sends these riddles uh, to the uh, different members of the council, uh, to the detectives. And many have described what God does in response to Job as giving him riddles. Uh, at no point does God give a direct answer to Job. When Job is crying out, I want to know why I'm suffering, God never says, here's the explanation. He begins to explain, were you there when I? And he presents him with riddles. He presents him with uh, things that Job could not possibly understand because of his limited knowledge. And of course, that's what Job comes to realize is he says, I've spoken what I did not know, things too wonderful for me, which I did not understand. Therefore, I repent in dust and ashes. Job recognizes that he speaks of things he couldn't possibly understand. And so those things that God says to him come to him as unintelligible riddles. And Sunday's notes, his riddles to the detectives uh, are likewise the same. Uh, they're possibly, these notes are possibly explainable to a point, where is Martin Tupper now? There are some who have explained who Martin Tupper is and how that fits uh, into the context. Um, Little Snowdrop could be a reference to the cat in uh, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Um, and there's some parallels there with Alice in Wonderland. But again, uh, they're ultimately, like God in the universe itself, incomprehensible. And so perhaps that's a bit of a disappointment for you. You might have thought that there were some deep... Uh, interesting theological or philosophical meanings to those uh, notes and riddles, I don't think there are. I think, in fact, they are meant to represent much the same way of God's response to Job, unintelligible uh, things, things that are too wonderful for us that we could not understand. And I think it's just yet another parallel that Chesterton has to the book of Job. Now, of course... If that's the case, why then does Chesterton make so many references to the book of Job and draw our attention to the book of Job so consistently? And I think that the answer goes back to what Martin Gardner had to say, is that like the book of Job, this book is centered around the question of massive irrational evil. Why is there evil in the world? Why are things so hard? Why 
why, why did they suffer so much? In fact, this is exactly what the characters are asking in this chapter. You let me stray a little too near hell, uh, the professor says. Gogol says, I wish I knew why I was hurt so much. Uh, these characters are struggling. They're in pain. They're in confusion. They can't understand the meaning of their suffering. And I think it's this very question that lies at the heart of the book of Job. Why does God allow the existence of such massive and what seems to be irrational evil? Why would God allow anything in the universe that seems so evil and is so opposed to his very goodness? And I think that by drawing parallels to the book of Job, Chesterton is alerting his reader that that's exactly the question he wants to answer in this book. And that's the question we're going to answer in the next lecture.